So we're going to continue here with our lecture on malleolar ankle fractures. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series, version 3, authored by Dr. Matt Graves. And I'm Saki Burman, and I'm about narrating these slides. So we're now in the uh, third in um, four videos uh, from this PowerPoint um, lecture. So we're going to move on now to the posterior malleolus and syndesmosis. Specific problem areas because uh, uh, you, you'll see there's a lot of pitfalls here. So the posterior malleolus uh, serves a function to provide stability to prevent posterior translation of the talus and also enhance uh, syndesmotic stability and it's shown here from the front uh, from uh, an, uh, sort of an axial view here and uh, sort of shown here on a lateral view. You give you a little better idea of the osteology. So um, on x-ray you want to certainly pay very close attention. The fracture pattern can be variable although you can't feel terribly confident on all the x-rays. Uh, it's difficult to assess the true morphology of the fracture powder on a standard radiograph, uh, on a standard lateral radiograph. So um, you do have to consider getting an external rotation lateral view in uh, many of these cases or a CT scan. So take a look here. This I think uh, illustrates it. So many of the typical posterior malleolar, malleolar fractures look like this, right? So this is anterior, this is posterior, right? So here's the posterior fragment. And here are the posterior inferior tib fib ligaments, for instance. Um, so you can see the Volkmann's fragment here, um, which this fragment is known as. Um, you should know that. Is um, typically has this this fracture angle uh, angulation here. So you can see it's not as line A shows, um, parallel to the x-ray beam on a lateral x-ray. It is angled typically like line B, and you have that uh, angle that it subtends. And um, that's why if you are to, here's a fibula, if you were to externally rotate the leg and get slightly externally rotated view, you might see it better, okay? That is, you will orient the x-ray beam kind of in this direction then. And that's something you have to sometimes also get intraoperatively. So here you can see some of the uh, fracture types. Uh, type 1 is similar to what we just looked at. However, you can also have something like this type 2 where you have extension all the way over to the medial side. And on the bottom you can see another type uh, of fracture that occasionally you might see. So what are the indications for fixation? Well, one is uh, based on stability. So if you have posterior translation of the talus, so if you have what the case you'll often see here is a large posterior malleolar fracture, uh, perhaps um, the uh, foot was, uh, well, in a pilon fracture you'd see this if the foot was plantar flexed at the time of injury, but if there's essentially a sh more of a shearing type of an injury with the posterior mal in the talus on the original uh, injury films going posteriorly, well then, um, that's a problem of stability and that will need to be fixed. If you have external rotation of the talus uh, and syndesmotic widening, that may also um, require fixation of the posterior malleolus. Uh, and as you can see, it's, it's, it's essentially an avulsion fracture to a certain degree. So uh, if you have syndesmotic injury, repairing that bony uh, uh, fragment can thereby uh, uh, stabilized that posterior inferior tip fib ligament as shown in the previous slide. And the other indication is for articular congruence. So um, if you are uh, missing, well essentially if the talus is not in contact with the large portion of the tibia, then you increase the contact stresses on the remaining area and that excessive stress can lead to post-traumatic arthritis. So you see there's a number down here, 33%. Well, the number is kind of I think it's a bit um, uh, questionable uh, and unknown, um, but um, uh, the concept, I think, um, remains. 
about that increased stress. So here are some different options to fix it. So you can see being fixed um, uh, with screws, you can go posterior to anterior, you can go to anterior, anterior to posterior, depending on the size of the fragment. Uh, you can use plates, I think plates uh, posteriorly, uh, as are shown here. These are helpful uh, for um, some of the larger fragments and posterior shearing type injuries. Okay. So let's move on now to syndesmotic injury. So uh, the function of uh, the syndesmosis is again to provide stability, helps resist external rotation, axial and lateral displacement of the talus, and allows for standard lo loading with weight bearing. So if instability is present, then you have to consider operative intervention. Um, so the considerations really are obtaining and maintaining an anatomic reduction to help reduce long-term disability and, and uh, improve uh, short-form uh, musculoskeletal functional assessment as uh, shown in these papers. Now, um, the question is exactly, you know, what's anatomic and um, that's a bit of a controversy to some degree you know, because of the variability and we'll get into that. And you can kind of see in these background images here how you have this you know, gross widening here of the, of the syndesmosis and increased uh, medial clear space uh, with the translation there, right? So, uh, how do you determine if instability is present? Well, we talked about in the previous videos manual stress test, for instance, or gravity stress test. I, I like the manual external rotation stress test, and that off typically will show widening the syndesmosis, increasing the medial clear space. So when do you perform it? Well, I mean, if you're trying to indicate, for instance, does a patient have an SCR2 or a ligamentous SCR4 with otherwise um, normal appearing syndesmosis on static films, well, then you may need to do a manual stress test if you want to know if there's significant um, syndesmotic injury. Um, but intraoperatively, what you do is you, you typically you, you fix the other fractures. Let's say you fix the medial side, you fix the lateral side, uh, and then you do a stress. You got to remember, you got to do this before you leave the operating room um, and not find out later on that you have medial clear space widening and opening of the syndesmosis. Uh, you, after you fix everything, you do that uh, external rotation stress test. And another test some surgeons will do is the, you know the cotton test, where you laterally translate the uh, fibula and see if there's widening. So what about obtaining an anatomic reduction or how do you get a reduction? Well, um, you know, typically uh, this can be uh, you know, done with clamps, can be done open, we'll get into that. One of the questions uh, used to be uh, do you have to dorsiflex when you do your reduction? So keep in mind that the talus is wider anteriorly than posteriorly, okay? So if it's wider anteriorly, you would imagine as you dorsiflex and bring the anterior part of the talus into the mortis, then that will um, you know, cause you know, stress or uh, you know, stress upon the syndesmosis. Therefore, many surgeons always felt that you should always uh, uh, do the syndesmotic reduction and fixation in dorsiflexion. Because if you did it in plantar flexion, you could reduce it, fix it, and then you would potentially be tight in dorsiflexion. Because if you fixed it in plantar flexion and it's held there, then when you try to dorsiflex and the wider part of the talus enters the mortise, it's, it's going to be tight and with no room to go. So this particular paper here was a cadaveric study uh, done by uh, Dr. Tornetta's group, published in the JBGS in 2001. And basically what, what they had done is um, uh, they took 19 cadavers, uh, they placed uh, the cadavers in, um, uh, well, they did 4.5 millimeter uh, screws for syndesmotic fixation, um, and then they really didn't find a difference whether they did the dorsiflexion or not. So that is when they fixed it in plantar flexion and dorsiflexed it, it didn't seem to um, to show any significant difference. So they concluded that you know, dorsiflexion is not necessary. This is a paper that gets quoted a lot, so you should be 
uh, aware of it. So what about obtaining a reduction? Well, obviously, obtaining a reduction uh, is a critical part of your, your uh, strategy here. Um, I kind of hinted at it. You can do it percutaneously. You can do it direct visualization. Um, that is, you know, percutaneously meaning um, using clamps, uh, checking radiographs. Uh, there's always a concern that you can potentially translate the fibula anteriorly with an anteriorly based clamp. And in fact, some studies, uh, as for instance, the one by Dr. Gardner shown uh, above, have shown that perhaps there is a greater than 50% incidence of malreduction when you actually get CT scans afterwards. Uh, and some have uh, suggested that you should do an open reduction of all these syndesmotic injuries um, to have direct visualization. Uh, radiographic imaging in multiple planes can be helpful, as can 3D imaging if you have like uh, the ability to get that 3D um, C-arm images, for instance, that can help show you tomographic type images to understand how the fibula is sitting, uh, like on an image like this. These are actual CT scans, but if you have the capability, some people can get these type of images in the OR. But what this is actually showing is that um, these are two uh, normal ankles uh, and just showing the anatomic variability. I mean, look how, you know, in this one patient, this is, you know, this highly sort of uh, curved, almost round syndesmosis. And then, you know, here's this other person's syndesmosis. So there's a lot of variability. So it becomes a little bit hard to really recognize you know, what's not really anatomic. Now, there's actually been some very recent papers showing that even though um, there's some variability also in, you know, how the post-reduction x-rays look like uh, and what we think might be non-anatomic, clinical results have not necessarily shown that to correlate with uh, having uh, worsening outcomes. That is, we may be overthinking this a little too much. That is, uh, so yeah, yes, getting a good a reduction is important, but uh, there is variability, uh, and uh, those reductions we think may be potentially imperfect don't necessarily seem to correlate with uh, having poorer outcomes. So this is still a bit of a uh, bit of a controversial topic. So. Um, so again, after getting a reduction, you want to make sure you can maintain the reduction, okay? So this is the next important thing, and uh, there's a lot of ways to do this. So, uh, you know, screws are the most common way to do it. Uh, what's not shown here are some of the other techniques, like um, uh, using uh, uh, suture-type uh, devices to uh, have a more uh, um, dynamic stability. Uh, bioabsorbable screws are another option. These are all showing uh, what I believe are 3.5 screws, but you can also use 4.5 screws. Uh, you can see there's examples here showing three cortices where you have the ability here, for instance, you can see it's not fixed here, the ability here to actually have um, possibly auto-loosening, and that is over time this screw interface can loosen here um, and allow for uh, less likelihood of the screw to break. Um, four cortices gives you a little bit more rigid uh, fixation. You can also go to two screws or two screws all the way across as shown here. It's controversial which one you use when. Uh, sometimes you know there are reasons where you may feel you might have to use more screws. Diabetic patients I think is a good example. And, and where to place the screw too. So typically speaking you really shouldn't place it directly through the cartilage usually right above the syndesmosis, uh, within about a centimeter or two are, are, is the uh, ideal location. So as I mentioned, three, five, four, five, three cortices, four cortices. Uh, another uh, controversy is whether you should retain or remove them. Um, and I won't really get into uh, the rationale behind all that. There's studies to support both ways, metallic versus uh, bioabsorbable. So here's a case actually of um, a syndesmotic malreduction. You can see it's, I would hope you can recognize, a fairly obvious uh, case. You can see clearly something's not right here. Something's not right here. It looks a little bit wide in either, in either place. Um, you can see that there's uh, 
most likely some uh, malreduction here. Um, and here you can see with revision fixation uh, and comparing the ankle to the contralateral side. And what I'm showing you is that uh, on this lateral and on this axial, you can see the fibula is a little bit too anterior. And on the lateral, you can recognize that too. The fibular shadow is, you know, coming all the way out here. Um, and here you can see on the normal side where the fibular, uh, you know, fibula should be sitting. So it's just a little bit off uh, in the other view. And uh, here you can see uh, some improvement in the reduction on the uh, bottom images. All right, so uh, I'm going to pause there and uh, we'll pick up with the uh, surgical goals, outcomes, complications in our final uh, video of this PowerPoint. Thank you.